Kyle, fantastic to have you back again. It's been a while. End of last year, you created quite a sensation with a series of interviews. Both it started with Grant interviewing you about your views on China and some other views, and that led us into a series of interviews that were sensational, I think, to say the least. They were a lot of fun. Yeah, and it was you know from everybody from Graham Allison through to uh, Miles Kwok and Steve Bannon. I think it was a eye-opening experience for so many people. You know, I'm just pleased to get you back. You reached out recently and said, listen, you want to go through really the full China thesis so we can really dig into that and have a look at it because it looks like there's a lot of interesting things going on right now and you've alluded to something that may come in due course, which is a kind of a knock-on ancillary to this that is a really big story that we won't talk about this time around, but just will allude to that there's something bigger out of this that has never really been talked about in Real Vision. I think that's going to be interesting. Right. That'll, that'll be a lot of fun. You know, four or five months from now, um, you and I will, will, will break an, a, new, a new idea that um, it's, it has its own idiosyncrasies. Um, you know, it is a Southeast Asian um, idea, uh, but it's one that... Is, uh, has reached a quiet panic and uh, has yet to reach a newspaper. And so it's a, that will be a fun one, Raoul, but we're not quite ready yet. No. So let's, let's, let's take stock of where we are in the China story. Because um, I know you've been making some presentations on this recently and you've now got a really fully fleshed out thesis. So talk me through where the thesis is now sure. and I, what's going on. You know, what, when, when Grant and I spoke, uh, again, the way, that the, the way that we look at China, the way that I think the world must look at China is, again, you know, we have the, the presentation here where we have two worlds. Um, you have China's world and then you have the rest of the world. And that's how China looks at it too. They have a domestic world that they control. They control everything. They control the price level and the narrative and the printing press and the police and they can do whatever they wanna do. And they can do that ad infinitum, especially if they don't inter interact with the rest of the world. But unfortunately for China, they actually have to interact with the rest of the world because what, they're desperately short resources. Desperately short energy, yeah. desperately short food, desperately short base materials, right? all of these things that they must go acquire. And uh, no one accepts RMB as payment because it's uh, just funny money. But people, there was an argument that a lot of people are making is, oh, they're doing these RMB swaps and they're opening up these lines so they can trade with Brazil and Argentina and RMB. Yeah, how's that or... going for Argentina? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, and Brazil, you know, like, come on. I, you know, and I know that that the Chinese have spent a lot of time in the Middle East trying to convince MBZ um, to accept RMB uh, for oil. It's like uh, Popeye asking, you know, to buy the, you know, the hamburger today, and uh, or Wimpy trying to buy the hamburger today and pay someone on Tuesday. It's like <laughs> in the end, everyone has to be able to convert back to something that's actually usable. Yeah. So you look at BIS and you look at uh, you look at SWIFT. Um, China purports to be the second largest economy in the world at 15% of global GDP at today's exchange rates, and yet. You look at cross-border settlements, less than 1% of cross-border settlements uh, in the world settle in RMB. So there's nothing they can do about it, really. They're trapped in dollars. Well, there's something they could do, right? They could just uh, open their capital account, but we know what would happen then. Well, don't they have to do that? I mean, this is what I want to get into, because I can't, you know, having talked to you and having looked at it myself, I can't see how they can keep it closed and still get the dollars that they need. Mm. So that's key. Uh, you're hitting right on the key point. Um, I think they could have their world of make-believe and their, their world of printing RMB and, and running their economy and convincing economists like Krugman and others that their purchasing power parity is higher than anyone's in the world. But the denominator is inflation. So they massively underreport inflation. That's just a fallacy. But I think that can go on for a long period of time as long as what? as long as they're growing their reserve balance, as long as they're growing their working capital, mm -hmm. uh, which is imports and exports, uh, as long as they're growing that number, FX reserves, they can keep playing with their domestic economy and playing with the printing press. But when the, I look at global imports and exports, there's an odd thing going on. It happened in 2016, 15 to 15, is that they're all kind of shrinking. Mm. So it doesn't look to me like China is growing either side of that equation. No, I mean, but if you look at industrial activity, we're going to skip forward uh, in the presentation. But if you look at pure subcomponents of China's industrial production, this is using NBS and one of our consultants. Uh, there are five subcomponents. Energy is the only one that's above zero. So you have infrastructure, transport, consumer goods, and property. Look at con look at the consumer goods number that's printing down ten percent year over year. We've seen it with car sales there, all sorts of stuff. C car sales just printed down eighteen percent. That's the most they've ever been down year over year. And then think about 
in nominal terms what volumes have been, right? So you have to think about car sales in percentage terms. Yeah. Then think about a number of cars. 18% yeah. of, the, of the largest SAR China's ever seen. So think about how many cars that is, Yeah. right? So the point being is they've been contracting their economy. They've been, they contracted their fiscal impulse beginning Q1 of 2016 um, when the money was really running. So G came out and said, national security is financial security. And that's when they started contracting their fiscal impulse. Right. They were running a 15% of GDP fiscal deficit at the end of 2015. That's ludicrous. I mean, it's uh, as large or larger than any country in the world. <laughs> and um, the way they can do it is they've printed a lot of RMB domestically. Right. Um, but what has, helped, what has helped them or enabled them to keep doing this is they've been growing the reserve balance, i.e. they were the world's factory floor, yeah. right? Their labor was cheap. And the way that China really subverts WTO rules is they give free, free property and free electricity to national champions, and that's how they grow big companies um, quickly. Yeah. Quickly, and they actually don't lose money until uh, they get much bigger. Uh, but they have all the basic inputs for free, and and so that also can that also can uh, as a state. If you and I were doing that, and we said, you know, we want to go to Europe and and uh, ruin the European aluminum uh, smelting business, well, you and I could do that if we had free electricity and yeah, free. And free property because one of the biggest inputs to aluminum smelting is right is energy. So yeah. they did that to the U.S. Right? They they dismantled our aluminum business. They were starting to dismantle our steel business until but they we started. They didn't just do it to the U.S. I mean, they did it globally. Oh yeah, right? globally. They yeah, just yeah, yeah. hold yeah, yeah, out yeah, yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. So the the point I'm trying to make is again when you look at this at this page here, you see that their augmented fiscal deficit reached 15 percent of GDP. And look back to 2008 and 2009 when they went to the gas pedal to save the world from the global financial crisis, their fiscal impulse was almost three times that by 2015. And now it's starting to contract and it's contracting five or six percent of GDP. It feels that something happened in 2015 when the dollar rallied mm -hmm. that China never recovered from. Correct. And something happened. There was the capital outflows that were happening over the time. And we'll talk about capital outflows later. But there's Something changed, the whole global demand supply situation. If I look at uh, world trade volume globally, it, it fell and it never really recovered. It's mm. kind of flatlined. There's something, something broke in the world at that point. I don't really know what it is, and I think it was probably China. Mm. I think you're right. I mean, you get, if you look, think back to the timeline, the 3% of the mini deval in China happened in, um, it happened in August 2015. Uh, and from August 2015, uh, Basically, a year later, they lost, what, a trillion dollars worth of reserves? Yeah. A trillion. They had 4-2, and they had 3-2. Um, there are a couple of really interesting um, observations that, that we make about this, and we'll start with, with this chart here. The red line, if you have a closed capital account, the amount of foreign currency or your offshore currency that should trade each night is just the sum total of exports plus imports, yeah. right, if you have a closed capital account. That's the red line on chart on page six. The yellow line is actual CNY turnover, which is reported every night by the Bank of China Hong Kong. The difference between those two lines, notice those lines stayed in perfect unison until just before the mini deval. And then they which have- Which if it's closed, it should be, right? Should be right on top of each other, right? Yeah. There might be some noise, but sure. let's just say on average, if you're to smooth it, uh, smooth it out to three months, six month running averages, they should be right on top of each other. Um, and these things diverged going into the mini deval, and they continue to diverge. Uh, it's, once it's again, the during the Trump election, once again now uh, into the into the trade. But this talks. is the largest divergence in history, right? And this is a right period now. where we've just seen the currency strengthen a little bit. You know, everybody's saying it's fine. There's no problems, and you're not seeing any diminution in the in the aggregate uh, balance of reserved, uh, reported FX reserves either. So where, is it, where are these outflows? What's going, well, these what's are illicit, going on? These are illicit capital flows that are just going unreported. So then what are their reserves? We believe their reserves. So they, they, you know, a few Nobel laureates went in and, and explained to China uh, in early 2016, maybe late 2015, that there's a certain reserve adequacy formula that, that a, uh, a, a heavy export and importing uh, country must have, as call it minimum levels of working capital for your machine to operate. Yep. And um, a lot of those inputs are how much short-term debt do you have, how much long-term debt, how, what's your imports, what are your exports, what are your near-term maturities. You know, there's a formulaic 
uh, set of inputs that gives you an output. And the output for China in early 2016 was 3.2 trillion. So imagine when they lost a trillion, it got to 3.2, it's flatlined magically at 3.2. Like all the other statistics out of just, China, right? Just because um, you, know, you, you see this, um, you see the capital flows but, but continuing to diverge. But meanwhile, we know they've trapped foreign corporations' capital in China. Correct. So it's not that money going out. Some money's going out somewhere. They've stamped on a lot of the billionaires exporting capital, mm -hmm. hiding capital. Yep. So where is this capital? Whose capital is it? So there's a really fun chart uh, <laughs> of something that happened recently. It's like a detective game, this whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's. I mean, it's just. It's exciting when you when you start to see things that. Uh, that are kind of corroborating your your um, you know your ideas. You're going to love this one, Raoul. You you, you of all people, <laughs> Mr. Chart. Himself. I love a good chart. Um, in November, precious stones, so diamonds, sapphires, opals, and the like. So in November 2018, they accounted for 53% of China's total imports from Hong Kong, up from 2.9% in Q1. So they went to 53%. But at the same time, sales of jewelry dropped 4%. <laughs> so this is a fascinating chart. When you look here, um, notice that this line of precious stone imports just went straight to the moon before the devaluation. Strange that, isn't it? Strangely. So I showed you on the other chart where prior to August 2015, there was a huge spike of outflows. Yeah. So those that were in the know, those in the Chinese Communist Party that knew that this deval was coming, ran. They got as much money out as they could they bought as many precious stones as they could at the old exchange rate, at the stronger exchange rate. Yep. And then post-deval, it doubled again. And then when Bitcoin became big, it collapsed. Hmm. So the wealthy Chinese figured there's a better way to get money out. And that was true. Yep. Um, and if you look at the Bank for International Settlements chart uh, on Bitcoin, it didn't print out so well here, but I can, I can show you. 95% of Bitcoin settlement was CNY based until January 2017. When did Bitcoin collapse? Yeah. The same time China closed the door on Bitcoin, Bitcoin collapsed. And then you know what happened? And then but the Bitcoin collapsed in 2018. At the at the beginning of 2018, right? Or the end of end of 17. Was it the end of end It was of the 17. it was the end of 17. China closed the door here, and then and then it ended up collapsing towards the end of the year. Yeah. So what I guess what I'm showing is all the different avenues of being able to go out and get get your money out of China. Like, how do you get it out? That's right. Right. You get it out by um, over invoicing if you if you run an import export company. Yeah. You get it out by going to a bank like Minxing Bank, and saying I've got a I've got a billion RMB over here. How many dollars will you lend me against my billion RMB? And then you just don't repay the dollar-based loan. Yeah, right? those are the ways they do it. But they charge you thirty percent to do that. Hmm. So it's kind of an exit tax. Yeah, uh, that's how the billionaires get their money out. But the way the masses get their money out uh, is they have to buy things. They can go to Hong Kong because, as you know, CNH uh, and CNY uh, there's there's no limit to the exchange in, in Hong Kong, uh, and so. They buy watches, they buy jewelry, but more importantly, to get real money out, you buy really nice gemstones yeah. and, and Bitcoins. But they also have the, from what I've seen, is you've got an ability that you get a buyback guarantee. So if you, what you do is you buy the gemstone in Shanghai. And but the guarantee is 90% of your original price. Exactly. So that, again, there's a VIG. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just. It's the price you pay to get money out. That's right. And but so how what's, are they doing what's interesting about that, Raul? Since, since rates have converged, yeah. right, Chinese and US rates are now equal to one another. So the one year forward cost of, let's say, selling CNH short yeah. uh, is now at parity with the dollar. It used to be as high as five, 6% of negative carry. Yeah. So now it's at parity. So why would you pay a 10 to 30% big to get your money out? Yeah. Because you know it's coming. Yeah. And it reminds me that um, the behavior reminds me before Argentina devalued in. 2003 or two, whenever it was, the big deval. All the elites got their money out. Yeah. Think about the tequila crisis in Mexico in 95. Yeah. What happened? The elites got their money out. Yeah. Think about Thailand in 97. Yeah, same thing. The IMF was urging the Thai government to devalue, and they wouldn't because all the military leaders hadn't gotten their money out. So the central bank held the peg until the military leadership got their money out. Uh, in, 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 in the tequila crisis in Mexico, 
The finance minister of Mexico, the day before the devaluation, made an affirmative determination on TV that Mexico will never devalue. And the very next day, what happened? They devalued. So what, what's interesting to me is we've seen a similar situation going on in Russia, Saudi and China, where anybody against the regime is, or in Russia's case, did get into trouble. They allowed some people to take huge sums of money out, mm. and that was public, Abramovich being a great example. Mm -hmm. But then there's a whole bunch of others who disappeared. There's been a lot of killing. There's been a lot of people being sent back to Russia. We've seen China, the same thing going on. And we've seen it in Saudi, this huge shift of taking all the money. What are they doing here? Are they taking some of the money back to support the reserves and allowing the right people that they perceive the right people to take money out? What the hell's going on? Because it's all related to this, obviously, somewhere. Look, I, my, I have opinions on those three that, are, that, that actually differ. But right. um, there's one thing that is uh, homogenous throughout, uh, or at least a common denominator throughout, and it's power. Yeah. And so, you know, when people like Jack Ma take pictures with the Queen of England, um, that, is, that is potentially usurping the power of, of the Almighty G. And that's probably bad for your um, net worth and your ability to travel with your family. But does he, did she want Jack Ma to take so much money out of the country? Or is this part of the crackdown of saying, oh, you've taken too much money out? Or, or she is only saying to some people, you can take money out, but you better not. We want your money back. No, I think, I think ostentatious displays of wealth are not good for yeah. China's leadership. Yeah. And I think uh, power or perceived global power is not good for China's leadership. So as you've seen, Jack Ma gave up his VIE structure ownership to five unnamed individuals in a nanosecond, and the world just kept moving on? How can, I just, you know, that came up in the interview, I think it was with Steve Bannon that you did, and you and I talked about, I cannot fathom, imagine if that happened to Apple, right? That's the equivalence. It is. That Apple suddenly loses its leadership and four or five unknown people take ownership of the firm. Right, and, and the world's okay with five unknown individuals uh, taking over ownership. It's just like when the H&A &H chairman, you know, uh, air quotes, fell off the wall. He was clearly murdered. His bodyguards murdered him. And the bodyguards don't work for him. They work for the, for the Communist Party. So when Jacques Ma travels around the world now, he's got bodyguards with him, but they're there to look at him and not after him, mm. right? Um, we've been told that he can't even travel with his family. It's either him uh, 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 alone or his family, but they can't travel together, i.e. they can't all leave China at the same time. Wow. Um, so, you know, this is the world we live in. Uh, and I think what you're seeing is a is both a power and a, and a money grab yeah. back to the call it the, the leadership, whether you want to call it the despotic leadership, the dictatorial leadership. I don't know what you want to call it. <laughs> Saudi was a little different. I think that in the case of MBS, you know, he rounded up about uh, a little more than 100 people and he took half their money. Uh, you know, and he, he uh, cattle you, you don't cattle prod billionaires and only take half their money. I think yeah, you have to go all the way or you don't do it at all. And I think he got a lot of blowback yeah. for that. But, but we hear that he took about $120 billion. That's right. That was a big number for Saudi reserves. Right, right? Okay. And you think about the predicament they were in yeah. uh, when oil, oil collapsed, they were running a negative uh, fiscal right. balances, right? Yeah. $100 billion bought them a lot of runway. And so with Russia, it was uh, Russia's Russia. We know yeah, what goes right. on. Who knows what goes so on. Then, so let's go back to that chart because that's, ch that's a shocking chart to me. It's assuming that there's enormous amounts of capital flight going on. Yes. And it's not uh, oh, showing so, up so in the, the currency the, the, market. One, the one that shows illicit capital flight. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So and that, you know, the diamonds obviously corroborates it. Yes. Uh, and then we'll show you also, you know, one, one of the things that when you think about, you think about how China operates, when you understand that they've now gone to current account negativity for the first time in the first half of 2018, what is important to China going forward is capital flows. And so when we put together this chart from SAFE and CEIC's database, when you look at the, at the green bars there, the green bars are the current account building that reserve balance that enables China to just keep printing money on the other side of their balance sheet, yeah. running their domestic economy they wanna do. That turned negative in the first half of 2018. So you see the green bars went negative the blue, the blue bars here are, quote, uh, net errors and emissions, which is Chinese for illicit capital flows. So the only thing holding China up right now... This hasn't changed trend. We still think that this is negative now. 
going into 2019? Well, so I'll, I'll say that when you think about what happened in, uh, in December, crude oil dropped from $75 a barrel to 40, what did it hit, like $43 a barrel? Yeah. That's one of China's biggest uh, imports yeah. uh, is crude oil. So that, that'll give them a, a brief reprieve on the, on the current account side of things. Yeah. But again, the question, the question with that is, that, is that a secular or is that a cyclical phenomenon? That's right. This is key to understand. See, you see the dotted line? Yeah. That's volume of crude importation by China using the right y-axis. And this is the dollar value of imports. So back in the end of 2014, early 2015, when crude collapsed from 100 to 30, yeah. they got a massive reprieve in their current account. Yeah. But if you look at the volume, does that line look like equals y equals mx plus b? It yeah. doesn't look very cyclical. No. Right? No, the, it's not. The thing about this, they were importing just under 300 million tons at the beginning of 2015. The most recent number is 462 million tons. Think about this. They're now importing 50% more crude in only four years ago. 50% more today than they were importing four years ago. That's staggering. Right? So is this a secular or a cyclical phenomenon? It is clearly secular when yeah. you look at this line. Yeah. And now what are energy prices will stabilize. So you, you say, well, are they going to have a positive current account or negative this quarter? And the fourth quarter is probably positive because oil collapsed. But in the long run, smoothed, they have a secular problem where they'll f from now on will have a negative current account. Right. They're starting to look more and more like Argentina and Turkey and the other twin deficit countries. Because what are they doing? They're running a negative current account. They're running a negative fiscal balance of roughly 9% of GDP. Mm -hmm. So they're running twin deficits. Their FX reserves are dwindling, and they're starting to borrow a lot of dollars. So how much of the FX reserves is liquid out of what's left? So, you know, you look at US- What's the composition of that now? Well, first of all, if you remember, when, when they were let into the IMF SDR basket, yeah. they said they would disclose the composition of their reserves within two years. Well, that was a long <laughs> time ago, and we haven't seen it. So again, look at what they say, and not, or look at what they do, not what they say in China, and clearly, they lied to everyone in, with, with that statement. Yeah. But more importantly, I think, getting back to your question, what does that composition of reserves look like? One thing we know for a fact is US Treasury tick data shows that they own a little bit more than, or a little bit less than 1.2 trillion in treasuries. Yeah. So we think that their only liquidity that they have that? Uh, any size of is, is our treasuries. Um, so they own a little bit of, you know, call it yen, euros, pounds, but they mostly own treasuries. We think the number's closer to 2 trillion instead of 3.2 trillion, yeah. which is dangerously below uh, adequate levels. Yeah, because it sounds like a huge sum, but for the size of the economy and the, and the potential capital flows, that can go super quick. So if we're gonna play large numbers here, yeah. the broad measure of credit in the Chinese financial system is $48 trillion worth of RMB. They only have two trillion of reserves. Think about these numbers, right? In their last banking crisis, which was between 98 and 2002, the loss given defaults were 80% of lo loans that defaulted. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, they had 35% of their entire system was non-paying. But so the, the counter argument always is from everybody is, it doesn't matter. But it's China. That's always the thing. It's China. They'll smooth it. Carl's being alarmist. Everybody's being alarmist. You're wrong, Raoul. It's not going to trade through seven oh, against know. the RMB. All of this, right? You know, and th those people sleep well at night until they don't. And, and that's the nickels in front of a steamroller approach. He, yeah, I think. I think what brings this to a head is the current account. When the current account goes negative and the reserve balance is going the other way, um, that the rubber meets the road. Then, as long as that balance is increasing annually along with uh, GDP and RMB terms, they can keep going. But as soon as those balances go, now their fiscal balance is negative 10, negative 9.5, their current account balance goes negative, and it's a secular negativity, then they have more money leaving than coming in. They have to desperately borrow. And they actually change. Now they're changing their laws. They say, oh, you know what? Now Westerners can own more than half of our banks. Not a problem. That's right. Yeah. Right? Obviously, please invest more in Chinese equities. They get rid equities. of all the shit they, they can. Right? So please invest more in Chinese equities. So when you look at at capital flows, this is, this is a really important chart, right? This is, this is from CEIC and SAFE. The red bar and the stripe bar is just portfolio investment and FDI. So without Western capital flowing into China, China can't hold this all together.
literally we are providing them. Which is Turkey and Argentina, right? That's the only way that they were supported. But what's interesting about China is this gives them, first of all, their economy has given them uh, the confidence uh, globally to to be more geopolitically assertive in their dealings. It's given their military the ability to be much more assertive in the South China Sea. And it's given Xi um, an aura that makes, that he's made the West think that somehow his economy, his economic model is superior to that of Western capitalism. And it's all a facade. The whole thing is a mirage. The whole thing is made up with the printing press, keeping a closed capital account and hoping the world doesn't notice it. But can they get away with it? Can they smooth, do a smooth Japanese style decline, 20, 30 years of below trend growth or growth that trends lower and just kind of work out the bad debts? You know, because Japan surprised everybody of how they actually managed it. Now it's a different economy because they have a bunch of surpluses, yep. but the, the other can thing they, they do have, it? I don't have the chart in here. Uh, I didn't bring it with me, but um, the other thing that Japan has that China doesn't, if you look at the net international FX reserve position mm-hmm. abroad, so it's the investments of Japan Inc. abroad, both, yeah. both from a sovereign perspective and from a savings perspective of the population, Japan's net international FX position is, call it 250% of their GDP. China's is 18% of GDP. And most of China's are the, the state, it's the left side of the PBOC's balance sheet, lending to ports in Sri Lanka, buying the port in Greece, yeah. owning a Ugandan copper mine in Congo, uh, you know, uh, mine uh, for lithium and things like that. Those are things they're not going to monetize and bring home. No. Right? So China doesn't have that net international effects position that Japan can really rely upon uh, to keep its dream alive. Now, Japan still runs a positive current account, and they, they have as much debt as Japan has a quadrillion yen of debt, right? Yeah. They also have a quadrillion yen of net international savings, but China doesn't. So Japan is a completely different animal. So there's two things I want to put into this. One of the things, you know, that I've been talking about, I think the probability of a global recession is is reasonably high at this point. What do you think it is? About 80%. 80. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. It's very high and all the data I look at looks like it's it's coming. Mm-hmm. Could it be 2016 again where we kind of avoid it because the Chinese got us out of it? I don't think that's coming. We, we saw that a fiscal stimulus in the US last two quarters and it's not going to help. So we're running out of something. Mm-hmm. We're running out of ability to get around this. Looks like Australia's about to go into the recession. You know, all of this is starting to happen. So let's assume Keteris Paribus in China, they don't do anything different, but the world goes into recession. They're screwed, right? Mm. Yeah, I think... Because they can't sell goods. And then so their, their current account... Goes more negative. Exactly. Yeah. Because you know, that offsets the oil thing. Because the fact is, because we saw it happened... A similar kind of thing happened when oil fell last time. It's because world trade fell as well. That's right. And if Chinese cannot sell enough goods, then that's the end of the game. I I think the writing's on the wall when you look at everything that you look at. You look at Australia, you look at Southeast Asia, but look at Italy just entered a recession a week ago. Yeah. You look at the subcomponents of Germany's industrial production, it's actually tracking right this minute as bad as it was when Lehman came down. And you know what it's highly correlated to? China. Uh, But that's my point. Like, Germany's headed into a recession. The U.S. numbers look really good right now. It's because we just stimulated at full employment. That's right. That stimulus, I think peak stimulus is February 27th. That's peak tax return day. Yep. And everything after that is just going to slowly head the the way the rest of the world's heading. So the U.S. looks good. We will be the last economy to, to roll. But Europe looks like it's heading into a full recession now. Australia's housing market and, and, and numbers look like they're already in a recession. Yep. Uh, Germany, look, Germany's bond yields are trading at, at uh, Brexit lows. Yeah. So, it's crazy. Yeah, and the European banks that you and I talked and, about and, before, that looks a mess. You know, the, the thing that I think people is, is lost on some folks is this idea that the IMF and the ECB can just, the Troika can uh, say, say, again, give Europe another save. Well, think about what they did with Greece. Like, the IMF was never designed to lend to even a small developed nation, right? It, they're, they're supposed to lend to African nations and other tiny nations that run into small balance of payments problems, yeah. right? And they're kind of the, the last money in, first money out dip lender to help people fix balance of payments problems. They're not meant to be a lender of last resort like they were in the Greek situation. No. But in Greece, you know, pre-crisis, 
the IMF could lend two times your rainy day fund if you were a member. And with a stroke of a pen, Geithner got that to 4x, four times your, your rainy day fund during the financial crisis. They, they agreed to lend to Greece 32 times the rainy day fund. They knew that day that they wouldn't be repaid. Okay. I've asked both sides. I've asked the guy that actually made the loan, and I've had the guy that borrowed the money, uh, and, and they, they both agreed. Yeah. So this is a fact. Yeah. Um, that was about 220 billion euros. Italy has 4 trillion euros of debt. Yeah. So I'm not, I can't see a case where if Europe has a proper recession, I don't know how they get out. They're already at negative rates. Germany's already trading at Brexit lows. Germany's headed into a recession. Italy's in one. If we have a proper recession in Europe, I don't know how the euro survives. No, I don't. I don't know how the euro survives. I don't know how the European banking system survives. And in that situation, I don't know how China can survive, particularly with Europe bad as well. It's, you know, it's a big part of the world. Europe's no small thing. Right. And we can see it in leading indicators. I think, I think Australia's a leading indicator in this example. The Aussie dollars basically led this whole thing lower all the way through. Yeah. Something in the bond market's telling us this. I mean, it's writ large as far as I can see it everywhere. And for me, look, there's n numerous things. I think the US bond market is one of, the corporate bond market is one of the issues that, is, that may blow up in this one. But China is the obvious one to me that something may happen. So talk to me a bit about the other thing that I think exacerbates it. Talk to me about trade and tariffs and what your perspective is. Because we, yeah. we've talked about it. And you've, you, you, you've been around DC, you kind of know what people's intentions are. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure whose intention is what and what the outcome people want is. I think whether you're looking through the National Security Council or the US Trade Reps Office or the Department of Commerce or the US intelligence agencies or the president and his own views, I think everyone has finally come to a conclusion independently and yet uh, collectively uh, that, a, that a global reset of our relationship with China has to be had. It's not this simple, oh, we run a 400 billion a year trade deficit with China, let's get the Chinese to buy some soybeans and some crude oil, maybe some LNG, and we'll work this thing out. That's not it. They yeah. steal $300 billion worth of IP from us every year, according to the Defense Department and, and the US trade reps reports to the president, and they earn a nice return on that every year. Yeah. Uh, that has to stop because that's the one thing we How have in this country. That? It's such an intangible. How do you stop There's, there are a number because of things. The court system things, is the usual way, and they but, don't have a court system. That's... But our court system, it's not written correctly. Uh, you have these rules. We can get into legal nuances, but the kind of the adverse inference rules and the rules that, let's just say, if the PLA steals technology from the US and then a Chinese private company launches with that stolen technology, we don't have any recourse no. to the company that's launching with stolen technology, but their government took it. If we, if we start changing the presumptions with the theft and making the burden of proof be on uh, the other side that's using the technology, uh, that in the US court system, that would be a real problem for China because we could start attaching uh, uh, lawsuit winnings to some of their assets here, yeah. uh, which would be a game changer. Right. And there's some basic policy prescriptions that we could change, uh, let's say, banking-wise, legal-wise, uh, and, um, and at the SEC, that would just level the playing field. Uh, if we could do a few of those things, uh, we could really, we could, make, US, we could make some quantum leaps in our relationships with China. The US that doesn't not, require their uh, buy-in either. No, but the US has not been particularly good at clamping down on China. Even the launching of all the companies, all the fraudulent vehicles in the US and stuff like that. The US is pretty slow at actually changing legislation yeah. to do stuff. What China is so good at is using money. Right? They use the Achilles heel to a democratic system based on capitalism is money. Mm. They buy everyone, yeah. right? They buy senior politicians in the US. They buy, um, you know, just recently, you know, the Washington Post puts China daily inserts in the Washington Post as if it's news. It is pure Communist Party propaganda, and they pay the Washington Post to put it in there, and it's like it's the, the, you know, the New York Magazine and the New York Times. It's not. You know, you go to Berkeley, California, and the China Daily and Global Times is being delivered for free. They have this incredible propaganda machine uh, that's disguised as news, yeah. uh, that's really, f they're foreign agents acting on our soil, yeah. and they're using money to distribute the propaganda. And they're good at it. 
And we as a country, you know, we'd rather earn the money. You and I were talking off camera about friends of ours that do business in China and they go to China and they get paid to give speeches. And they wouldn't say anything bad about them. They would never say anything bad about them. And you know, there are people at think tanks whose wives teach the Chinese Communist Party uh, members English and their family members English. They've never said a one bad thing about China in any of their think tank reports. You know, it's how China plays such a beautiful game of coercion through money that you say, how does it stop? Well, you know, maybe we just need some, some uh, uh, thick disclosure requirements if Chinese money's you know, coming in the country. My issue is it's so pervasive and it's so deeply entwined with the political and economic system of the US and elsewhere that nobody stops it. It's like that, you know, you know how it's like with the pharma companies and all of the others, <laughs> right? This is not a world you want to get into but because that's, but that's it's the Achilles so heel rotting. of a democratic, it is. Capital, a capitalist it is. It uh, based is. system. But let's talk about, let's say we can't change that bit yet because it's not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. So we're going into a deadline that Trump put the March, out. The March 1st deadline. The March 1st deadline. Yeah. We were talking off camera that sounds like it's softening a bit. Uh -huh. But there is, I think, zero chance that the Chinese can agree anything about intellectual property and technology within two years, right? This is a complex, difficult negotiation mm -hmm. because there isn't a rule of law that's applicable and easily enforced, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to figure some way of a trust-based system that will work. So I don't see that happening. If the US administration really is after the IP stuff, which is what you, you say that's the real game. Well, I think it's just part of the real game, right? It's, it's the, it's the uh, mili militaristic uh, aggression in the South China Sea. Right. It's their industrial policy that, yeah. some, that circumvents WTO rules. It's espionage and theft and the lying, cheating, and stealing that the Chinese do. We have to figure out how to stop it. So therefore, if that's the case, if it's a really big game to play, yeah. then this March deadline is meaningless. And the markets are gonna sniff this out pretty soon, right? Right, and if you and I were the Chinese, well, we would do exactly what the Chinese did in their first overture to our negotiating team. All they said was we will eliminate our trade imbalance with you over a six year period. It was brilliant in a number of ways. It looks like it gives Trump a win. Yeah. They only have potentially two more years of Trump anyway. Uh, so they're just trying to wait him out. Um, we've been in these trade negotiations for a long time. If you think about when we first started engaging in trade negotiations with China when she was at Mar-a-Lago. What's happened since that day? Not a damn thing. No. They're just playing the waiting game, which is they're really good at. But then all I'm trying to think of this, does this increase the probability now that seven goes in the RMB and it starts trading eight, eight and a half, nine, because there is no conclusion. So the US has to play hardball and global growth and Chinese exports are going to suffer. You know, it's, this will not be determined by our government or theirs. Like if, if again, if, if all the training wheels came off the bikes, we'd already be at eight or nine yeah. on the RMB. Yeah. What you're asking is, will, will a trade impasse accelerate the move? Yeah. Absolutely. Will we have a trade impasse? Is there some sort of hybrid where they agree to some uh, agreement on trade and then they ag agree to timetable uh, a longer discussion on industrial policy and uh, intellectual property theft, maybe. Maybe Trump could, uh, could uh, call that a win. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's prob I actually think it's going to be somewhere in the middle. I don't think it's going to come to, you know, blows or, you know, uh, pencils down and walking away from one another. I think, I think China's desperate uh, to get something done because the, the trade talks, while they're small, we're talking about 50 or $100 billion a year. Right? We're talking about 10 or 25% tariffs on a total number of 500 billion. Yep. So we're talking about 50 to $125 billion, right? On an economy of 13 over there, an economy of 20 here, 20 trillion, this does, it shouldn't matter. But we were just talking about their reserve number might only be 2 trillion. That's right. So if they're going to lose another 100 billion a year in tariffs, that's a real problem for them. And what I've noticed is the decline in the value of the RMB pretty much offsets the tariffs. So if they were to increase the tariffs by 25%, to me, it's got eight written all over it. It's just another way that I, I look at it. I just think that, you know, they offset it as fast as they can. Now, what's weird is 
the RMB is a, it's a currency basket, essentially. But the, it seems the knock-on effect through the lack of trade is the euro falls, the Aussie falls, all of these things fall. So it's all it's highly correlated, as we know. So yeah. I just that's why I'm just I'm just for me I'm just sensing that, and I know you you don't really want to go necessarily to a catalyst point, but I'm feeling like there's a catalyst point racing towards us, which is a deadline that's not going to mean anything. I agree. It's going to be a half answer because nobody can actually create an answer. It's impossible to get an answer done. We've got you said okay. Peak fiscal stimulus, February 23rd. Well, then, by the time you get to March and April and May, what we've got is fading. I think the US economy is slightly weaker than that anyway. We're seeing the global economy fading. We're seeing the bond market telling us something. So it's, to me, it's like, OK, we're rushing towards something, and the capital numbers look like there's money leaving China mm. right now and that there is something going on. You, you, you've, you've set it up properly, Raoul. I mean, I, I don't want to be a near-term no, catalyst that. Armageddon person. No, I get but, that. But look at what's out there today. It's everything you just described, and you left out just a few things, right? We have the March 1st deadline for trade. Yeah. We have the mid-May European parliamentary elections where you're going to see, uh, let's say, populism uh, you know, raise its ugly head once again. Yeah. Um, you're going to see early elections in Greece. You're going to see the Italians go crazy again on, on the budget. Yeah. Um, you see what's going on in Spain. They're voting the Catalans. Are, have got we're talking about voting. a potential hard Brexit coming, what, in March? Literally, there are so many things going on right now that are so, and each in their own right, is enormous. So the market is an enormous uh, contributor to the global economy. And the market is actually choosing to ignore them and hoping we get through every one of those speed bumps and don't fall over? Not fall over. I think they, they, the market's priced as if we're going to walk through there squeaky clean. It's a fascinating time to be alive because I think the machines are running the, the, the ball game here and um, it's, hu it's really human interaction and human intuition that's going to determine the outcomes of many of these situations in the next four or five months. So if people can't trade the R&B, what are the other obvious knock-on effects? I'm, as you know, I'm I'll just say, well, if the world is going to shit, the US bond market is going to be the best place in the world. Yeah, and by the way, you, you rightly called. You basically said all you need to own, I think, <laughs> right. I can't remember, it was bonds and diamonds, <laughs> uh, right? And, and that was like six months ago, and you called it just right. Yeah. I mean, you get an A plus <laughs> for that call. Um, but it's just the beginning. Yeah, and it feels to me, I'm looking at the currency market again, and it looks like the dollar looks like it wants to break higher again. Oh, wait, I thought when U.S. rates go lower, the dollar's going to get killed. <laughs> That's the argument. That and the dollar's going to use it, lose its reserve status and all of these things I'm hearing from all these people. Exactly right. I mean, I think they're all dead wrong. I think they're dead wrong. I think the, the world has a problem and it's, there's not enough I dollars. I knew I liked you. <laughs> <laughs> I think the world doesn't have enough dollars. I think China is the biggest problem with the shortage of dollars. Yeah. The dollar will go higher in any slowdown, I think, regardless of what rates do. Mm -hmm. And that's concerning. It looks like it's starting to happen now. The DXY broke 97 today or yesterday. And I look at things like the Aussie. And the Aussie for me is a great one because that's, a, that's at the epicenter of all of this. It is. You know, if I'm looking at one thing, it's bonds. And I think the Aussie dollar is one of them. And the euro is, just seems... Yeah, I mean, you know, if the US dollar is going to lose its reserve status, what ex which currency are you going to own? You're going to own the pound? Because if there's a hard Brexit, it's going to go to parity. Yeah. Are you going to own the euro? Because if they have a recession, that's going below parity. Uh, are you going to own the RMB? No, you can't really spend it. You might as well just go buy another Monopoly game. That's like, the problem. What are you going to own? What do you own? Yeah. Well, you're going to own dollars. Yeah. That's what you're going to own. Yeah. So let's see what happens with the Chinese thing. I think the story's building, and I'm, I'm waiting eagerly for the second part of this story because we talk about knock-on effects, and you know, we're talking about the Aussie dollar and the US dollar and the US bond market. There's potentially a huge knock-on effect that everybody's missing, which That's I know right. you're putting together a thesis it's, and some... It's, it's the most asymmetric trade ever seen in my entire life, and it's staring us right in the face. Yeah. And we will pick up on that the next time we get together. Excellent, Carl. Thank you ever so much for coming wow, in. thank you. I look forward to it.